to this webinar on Building with Earth. We had quite a record of registrations, so I guess it's an interesting um, topic of today. My name is Marlus Reining and I'll be your facilitator today. I'm one of the directors of the Regenerative Collaborative South Africa, which is a voluntary non-profit organization trying to educate people about reg regenerative design and yeah. So let's get going. Uh, we didn't get a sponsor for this webinar, so we're running low on reserves. So if you know anybody that wants to become a sponsor of one of these webinars, please let us know or give us a hint or a nudge um, of somebody. Like we're only asking 5,000 rand to sponsor a webinar, so it's, it's not that much. So let me know if your company wants to sponsor. We would really, really appreciate it. Just a recap of all the webinars we did last year. We were quite consistent in like having a webinar every month. And I think we did quite well on the topics and we had great attendance. So hence it gives us uh, enough motivation to keep on going and come up with 11 new webinars this year in 2023. You can always look at old webinars on the GreenNet website slash RCSA and you can find recordings from last year if you're interested. Also, if you want to help us, as I mentioned, Regenerative Collaborative South Africa is a voluntary organization. If you want to come and join us on an admin side or help us organize webinars or uh, help us on the social media side, any help is appreciated. So please reach out to us. You have an hour to spare and to assist us with these webinars and social media. Also, we sort of sorted for like almost till June with um, topics, but we're always looking for other topics and new topics. So if you have an idea and you want to win 500 rands, let us know your topic and then we can check if we can do a webinar around them. It would be appreciated if you also have some speakers or sponsors in mind that can support the, the idea. But today, we're doing a webinar on building with earth. For me, it's a quite interesting topic. We looked at building our office with earth, but in the end, we ended up building with um, steel and timber. And I'm lo really looking forward to all the presentations and projects that have managed to build with earth. I'm just going to give you some examples that I have found very interesting project. The one is the Clip Fontaine Eco Lodge in the Free State done by GLH Architects, a beautiful, beautiful lodge. And I think Janice will share some of the links to uh, videos on these projects so you can see what the process was of actually building these buildings. But we're going to see a lot more from Paul and Matthew today. And the Helderberg Nature Reserve, which is a project we also featured last year at the end of the year, a project with, which used a lot of um, different types of um, building techniques. And I think Paul was also a little bit involved with this one. And then this is quite an interesting one, and I think everyone is waiting for this one to become <laughs> either more public or more realized. It's the it's like pre pre designs of Abu Mbeki Presidential Library, and and I think it's going to be built in my neighborhood. So I'm very excited to have this built. But the experts have having some concerns about structural stabilities of this architectural design. But yeah, it looks very very nice. Anyway, let's get to the order of the day, and I'm going to introduce the two speakers to you um, that are going to speak about building with earth. And first one up is Paul Murray, and he's got a couple more gray hairs than the picture that's here, but <laughs> very happy to have him here. And I guess he can definitely be called an expert in building with Earth. In 2003, he decided to move out of the city and build his own building. So I don't know if he's going to present on that, but um, he's definitely had a lot of hands-on experience on uh, building with Earth and making his own home off the grid with a wind turbine, solar energy, solar heating and biogas. So it sounds all very regenerative. And then second up is uh, Matthew, also a very experienced architect, and he's done a project on building with earth quite a long time back. And um, I don't know if he's regretting it or actually still proud of his work, but <laughs> he's definitely going to share uh, the experience with his project um, with us. And he's currently working as a, as a senior architect 
with an IDC um, architect. Where did you find that picture, Marlis? Um, Google. <laughs> oh, really? That's very young. I think you also got some extra gray hairs <laughs> these days. <laughs> anyway, you can go for it, Paul. Um, I got involved with, with natural building for about 30 years ago. Started with some projects in Mozambique and uh, have actually basically through default become a RAMD specialist. I never set out to specialize in the medium, but it seems to be a medium that's chosen me to specialize in it. So what I'm going to show you is all my own uh, work. Um, and as we go through, you'll look at just some of the issues and details that come up when you're building with earth. And and the main thing I want to say, just, just and we will go through this, but you know, we really are in a crisis at the moment. And unless we change to materials that have lower carbon footprints, and all materials that also uh, mitigate the use of energy in our buildings are going to handle the climate crisis that's coming up. Okay, so uh, this just uh, lays out what we're going to look at, and uh, I'll go straight on to the introduction. See if Malaz has got that. That building on the right is is a is a lodge we did in uh, Kruger Park um, with Nicholas Freeman Architects, and uh, you'll see a few photos of it. But basically, Rand Earth has got a very low carbon footprint. I favor stabilization with lime, though there is cement and bitumen that you can stabilize with, but those have problems that lime doesn't have. And as a result, it's got a low carbon footprint. And just to say, look, if you are stabilizing with cement and you put thick walls in, you're probably not saving the environment. So I think if you do cement stabilized ramped earth, it's actually not doing anything. And the other thing to point out is that when you stabilize with cement, it actually destroys the thermal qualities of the rammed earth. So rammed earth has got, and uh, uh, we're getting onto the thermal mass, but it's got a unique ability to actually absorb heat and then uh, ra radiate out heat depending on the, on the situation. So if it's very hot, it'll actually absorb all the heat. And I've done a few projects in Botswana where we've had temperatures over 45 degrees and it's still perfectly comfortable working temperature inside the building. And that is because it actually has a less dense material than concrete, but it, it traps water vapor in the wall. And as you know, water is a very good, uh, very good thermal properties and absorbs and, and releases energy very quickly, whereas air is an insulative material. It's also abundant. And uh, a lot of my work has actually shown that we can almost use any soil on site and I've done some very interesting stuff building in Botswana for example we build a soil that people say is unsuitable for rammed earth but my work has shown that actually you can pretty much use any soil if you modify it and know how to get it to work and the other one is we did some acceptability tests when we were in Botswana and we asked people whether they would live in a rammed earth building and we found 95 percent of people are happy to live in such a structure and that's a lot higher. I mean, when you look at um, earth br bricks, for example, adobe bricks, we have about a 35% acceptability level there. We're talking about in Southern Africa. So it's, it's a very acceptable material and it's quite desired by architects for its amazing beauty. Okay, so, I, and I touched on this mixed design. Now getting the right mix is critical for rammed earth. I've actually done a lot of work uh, in this field looking at how to make soils work. So I've done I mean, that picture up there on the left shows a, a bulldozer in, in the Kruger Park. That's a pit that they're using to build roads from. And road mixtures are quite suitable mainly for building, except they might have rocks that are a bit bigger than what we like. But essentially on the right, you can see different soils, different colors. And uh, you know, getting, getting your engineer involved and actually choosing a, a mix is, is, is a challenge. But you're basically looking for a mix that, that has some gravel, some sand, some clay in it. The clay holds the whole thing together. And when we stabilize with lime, what the lime does is actually waterproofs that clay. So if you put too much lime in, your bonds are going to be weaker. The clay bonds are actually stronger. So we always like to, we actually do a lab process where we actually test different stabilizations in a, in a soils lab. And from that way, we get the right mix. Okay, so 
Obviously, the other one is, is the amazing patterning you can get from uh, Ram Earth. And then I've just got a few tips for other architects. One is have a dark or a light color in your banding. That really helps to set your, your balance. Don't go with too much contrast. Um, kind of isn't fun living in a, in a zebra striped house. So it looks great in Instagram photographs, but actually, and uh, you'll see that middle photograph there in the, in the slide, that's the kind of finishes I think that we should be aiming for. Actually, people have a strong affinity to earth. I think it goes back for millions of years. People have lived with earth, been with the earth. And, and we actually like the restful um, cool tones that earth gives us. But those are three different walls, all created for different things. Uh, and the other one you have to watch with the earth house is obviously not to get too dark inside. But the standard thing of, of using a lot of white is a bit more challenging with earth. What I tend to do in my designs is use white ceilings, uh, light floors, and then the walls, because they're not as reflective as a white or a light colored wall, to use them in the building and it, and it gives you sufficient light. Okay, so that picture there is a, is a, is a building we built, I designed and I built in the Monaghan farm, and it's actually completely cement free. So even the foundations uh, don't have a massive concrete footing. I did add that is that does have good bearing potential there, but it, uh, you know, we did actually go down two meters and stamp up. We built a ramp earth foundation under that. The floors of that building are earth, also earth. So that's, except for the roof, an entirely 100% earth building. And, and the challenge is that if you, when you build with earth, you're going to be building thicker walls than usual. Uh, generally, uh, in South Africa, yeah, we use 400 to 600 thick walls. Um, and that, if you're going to do a concrete foundation, requires a massive concrete foundation. And so the whole thing can be lost. If you then put a massive concrete foundation in, your, your, your carbon savings are basically negated. Yeah. So one done has to be. And the other uh, other thing, I think the next slide shows it. The other one is to use uh, stone footing. Yeah, that, that picture, you can see the stone footing there. And that's actually done within the same formwork. But we find that if you do it, if you actually put up the formwork first, you can slap in the stones up very quickly and very cheaply. Um, you don't need a stone mason to place those stones carefully. Uh, and that is the traditional footing that was used the traditional Rambert buildings, and many of them have been standing for five to six thousand years. So, yeah, I mean, your, your challenge is, is, is getting the engineering to work on the stone footing. I've certainly often had to build test samples that the engineers can actually test to see uh, how strong the footings are. But, but all of them, whenever we've done them, they always passed any uh, actual testing we've done. And on the stone ones, you start with bigger stones at the base, and then you move up to smaller stones, as you see in that picture. That picture, yeah, it's just a picture of my big rambles wall. We haven't put any joints in there. We're going to see if it cracks or not. Okay, so yeah, here we've got an example of a, of a concrete footing. These were, these were actually samples done for the client. Very expensive samples where they cross the concrete. And the other one is, you see what this does, it brings the the, the interface between the earth and the floor above ground. And you'll find if there's a lot of examples where people have done that. So that really helps. There's a lot of wear on the corner of the wall where it meets the floor. By lifting up on a small plinth wall, um, you can avoid that problem. This is a massive, I think this plinth wall is about 400. And um, it was done like this for aesthetics as well as that might have found, but also all the services run in the concrete, which is a bit easier because services in ramp earth walls is actually one of the challenges, but you know they, they are easily overcome. The challenge for designers and in South Africa, we're not used to that. We actually have to think about everything before we build it. Ramp earth doesn't suit a make it up thing as we go. You really have to have considered where you need your services beforehand. Okay, and then, you know, with the services, which are challenges, obviously wall openings. And every wall opening needs a, a lintel, but also it needs to have a, a volume displacement box made. You basically have to make a positive of that negative space. And this is actually 
where your costs can spiral in a in a grand bed. So I've shown that example. This is the house we built up in Botswana. And what we've done there, we've put windows very high above. That's actually a nice, elegant way to finish off the top of the wall. Where the wall meets the ceiling, and we don't have to obviously put big lintels in. But that photograph also shows on the right the doorway. And you see there we've got actually steel controls. You can either have, and, and we've varied on projects, some projects we've had massive steel um, sections made up that have been lifted in with a crane into the formwork and then stamped on. And in other um, examples, we use angles and, you know, they come, we put five or six together into the form. And those can easily be lifted in by two people. So constructability of rammed earth actually does make a big difference to the cost. I actually advise a lot of architects and engineers on actually how to get things built, um, even if I'm not involved. Just as, just as a consultant, you can give them. Lintels are, are, are a challenge, and I'm going to show you some openings where you don't put a lintel in. So generally under about 600 millimeters of space, get away without a lintel. It will actually support over that gap if you've got sufficient uh, earth above the window. If you've got a 600 by 600 space above the window, you can get away without a lintel. And below that, We've also used um, concealed lintels where we'll put reinforcing, steel reinforcing into the wall and stamp that in. Obviously, the, the metal plates are, are very favorable. They give you a very good lintel and they only, from the front, you only see the one little millimeter of the, of the wall. And then you can also do concrete or timber beams that are cast in. And in fact, oh, we did a house in Newark. I haven't got photos of it, but we used timber. It was timber uh, throughout, and we used timber placed into the wall. You'll see we cut those steel ones away where they go into the wall, so you don't have a horizontal line going into your wall. But uh, well, on the trick there is not to have them too heavy that they can't get to that. This is again an elephant point. That's actually a massive window. Um, we might not realize, but that wall is over six meters high. And uh, that's a big, big opening. But we've got a very thin steel concealed beam holding up the wall. Also, just to take note in this picture, is the shrinkage joints. Every five meters or so, you need to put in a joint, the same as you do for concrete. The material does shrink and it, and it will crack. And so we've tried to uh, push the cracking into to little joints so that it's not visible. The cracking is not structurally any impediment, but um, it's it's, uh, it's an aesthetic. Uh, just to say that wall is is a load bearing rammed earth wall, and it's actually concealing. There's a, that's a parapet going up behind that parapet. The massive concrete slab. Originally they designed it to take all the services for that building. It's all going to be on top of that slab. So, you know, don't worry that the earth can't take the, the load. This, you know, engineers were pretty confident that uh, we'd be able to handle all of that plant up there. Okay, again, and there I wanted to show you that picture. This is an otter cottage in Botswana. Um, there we have used no lintel. Just made the opening and put the window in. The earth is, uh, I think it's got two Y12 bars in the, in the earth above the window. But besides that, it's actually just made with our volume displacement boxes. And always on the volume of displacement boxes, we make them slightly tapered. The thing from mold making, you'll know you've always got to make a mold. You don't make it square, you make it slightly off square so that it moves up easily. Because the forces of ramming are quite considerable. But you don't get those boxes up. Even with a taper, they're quite turning them together. Okay, and the other trick we do, I mean, obviously with thick walls and uh, sometimes small windows to satisfy your XA requirements, um, you know, we splay the windows. You can see there they've been splayed, and that's an old medieval technique of uh, allowing more light into the window because obviously the walls cast less shade in the window. And that's also, I mean, this is at Monaghan Farm. You can see a nice example of uh, a very neat uh, 
installation of, of windows to the land earth wall. And I just want to say on this project, we actually uh, post measured every opening, even though we use the same formwork to make the windows, the pressures resulted in a couple of millimeters difference. So these windows were set in and on this project, we cast in um, vertical timber pieces in, in the earth so that they're just quite easy to come in later and uh, screw in those windows. Um, those have uh, steel lintels on top and they're made up from separate pieces of angle iron, which as I said, makes it a hell of a lot easier to, to get the... Those are both from the same project, but it is something to, to consider when you kind of get windows in. And the other one is, you know, with the thermal mass, one of the problems is that the models are generally don't understand thermal mass. So you do sometimes struggle a bit with the XA. Um, we have done insulated rammed earth walls. It is possible to put in uh, solid insulation in the center of the wall. It is a way for cold climates or very hot climates to satisfy the regulations. Okay, next slide. Okay, there I just wanted to show um, just on the walls, that's a big wall. Um, and in fact, we don't have a joint there. We, we just, those lines you're seeing are actually the formwork lines. But even there, they are slightly narrower. That, that, that wall is load bearing. It's carrying a roof on top. Getting, you're getting your pattern that is cast in one piece and it will hopefully shrink from the uh, the. the but it is generally at about five meters you should be putting joints in. Um, I have done up to 18 meters without a joint and we've got no cracking. So you don't go and uh, take a, I'm saying it is possible to push because these are rules of thumb. But a good material, you can do better. If you've got a bad material, it's going to crack like crazy. Um, just to say cement stabilization also cracks a lot more than lime. The lime is a much more flexible material able to actually take some bending and moving and earthquakes and general movement of the earth that happens. Okay, so there again, I can see there we've just put, we've actually built the corners first in this project. So the corners have an expansion. We have a long flat section of wall. Of wall. This, is, this is actually material that has got no real property to build around earth. It's, it's, it's in Botswana. It's the extremely fine sand. We added a few uh, rougher particles into it, but only at about 2%, um, and it's lime stabilized, which considering that its PI is 0.2, it, it, it's amazing that it worked. But as I say, we do, we do test this lab test it, and, and we do find some surprising results. And we, we've basically developed a process now to test soil and to see if it's suitable before we, we build the entire house. Okay, and then uh, obviously attaching, we're going to look at roofs and, and, and attachment. Um, this, this is again this elephant point building. You can see that massive six meter high wall. Um, on top there, just take note, there's a, there's a steel coping. So uh, there's obviously uh, an earth wall exposed totally to the rain doesn't doesn't last that well uh, and even these parapets are a little bit uh, risky but uh, architects like like it so that's what gets done i prefer generally we advise people to have a good roof overhang so that does protect the rain earth we will get a bit of faster wear on this this one we've actually overcoated with a sealant to to try and mitigate the water runner down it. Um, it's, it's, it's a completely invisible sealant, but what it does, it pushes the water away. But in between there, you'll see there's a, there's a massive steel roof. You can just see the fascia there. And that is actually held into the ramp earth with, with blocks. We made steel cages that we, we when we were stamping, we put them in. There's concrete cast in there. And that roof, um, goes on the corner and has spans of over 10 meters. It's all suspended from this load bearing ram earth. So and there's quite a moment of, of bending there. 
but uh, that is possible, and uh, there are, you know, you can do quite a lot with the earth. Don't think that's just uh, very soft material. Out of interest on this project, um, our steel engineer, he was he was interested in how strong. I said to just put it in with some some chemical anchors. He, he didn't trust me that they would work, so he actually tested one. The chemical ex, uh, anchor actually pulling directly out uh, took a ton of, of, of pulling force, a thousand kilogram pulling force to pull it directly out. Normally the anchor is actually 90 degrees, so it's much stronger than that. It's not pulling directly out. But just to say that uh, that's just a standard chemical anchor going into the wall and it held a ton. We were able to use our sample walls to actually test things like this out on site. Because engineers are unfamiliar with earth, and um, so actually on a project like this, you have to test everything. Okay, then uh, obviously, so one of the challenges of, of earth is that it's not as, as, as tensile and tensile strong as, as a brick or uh, mortar and, and what we call conventional construction. I'm quite nervous to use that word because it's not really conventional. This is more conventional. But you do have to watch for wind upliftment. So, um, so what we've actually done there is, you know, from those concrete foundations, we have rods that run through the entire height of the wall and they, and they attach to those big beams that you see coming through holding the roof up. But as you guys know, the biggest challenge is actually to hold the roof down. If it holds up, that's fine, but when a massive storm comes, especially on a flat roof like that, it's going to get lifted up quite easily. And then the front, hold it with a column. So um, the other way that we do it is we put dead man in the wall. So usually at about a meter below the wall, we, we start putting a piece of wood with a strap around it, and we start pulling up straps. So it's not the 600 millimeter that you use in brickwork. Um, we tend to you'd rather go for at least a meter and even further if if it's a very high I mean coastal areas coastal areas would generally always just come off the foundation so you have a couple of, of uh, stays that go all the way through the wall from the ground up to the roof um, as you can see here we have um, overlapped that roof not a huge amount but sufficiently this is again in mine in Botswana and the rain there gently comes very flat down. We've had we had a bit more challenges in the Cape where the rain tends to come horizontally, and we certainly found that the the, the, the windward side of the house is varying faster than the other. And generally now we always overcoat the earth in those areas to reduce the the water test. There is actually a spray test we can do. Um, on rammed earth or any earth building, to actually see how it will last against the water. And again, that's worth doing uh, for you uh, foundation construction phase. Okay, and here again, um, just looking at the, this roof. But again, we've got some beams, those are attached down. Also, just note on this picture, there's a, there's a low level window, um, and that's got a massive uh, steel lintel to create that effect that the earth is just floating on, on the air. This is part, of, and I, I really should actually, while I'm here, I'll just talk about the cooling of this house. What actually happens is there's a natural pond, three sides of the house, that low level window, air gets, goes over the pond, picks up moisture, it comes in the bottom there, and it's, you can see just in the top right corner, some high vents and the, water, the, the air, hot air actually gets extruded there. And this building with passive systems, just with good design, and with the Earth's thermal mass, um, hardly ever goes over 27 degrees. And uh, if anybody's worked in Botswana, they'll know that 27 is actually the comfort zone in Botswana. It's not the 22 degrees or even the 19 degrees in Europe and Scandinavia. Um, but so this, you know, and it, it really is using the earth um, to absorb that moisture and, and pull out the heat out of the day. And then in the evening, um, 
it re-radiates back when the temperature drops, because Botswana is, I mean, it does have that, that uh, desert, hot days, cold night swing, it keeps you warm inside. And this, uh, this is this Helderberg um, visitor center. Now, on this one, we've got a different situation. There's a massive concrete roof on this building. And, and yeah, just to say, I was involved with the design of this building and did we did this massive Randolph wall. It's about 60 meters long and it's about five meters high. And, it, and it's 800 millimeters thick. It's, it's quite a substantial piece of earth. Um, and it took us a month to build this. Um, we, we actually demonstrated that if you bring in with machines and not just hand stamping, you can really uh, um, get, get stuff um, done. Uh, and you see it's got a massive building over on the front there, a nice round curve. But on this situation, the roof is actually, this is concrete columns that go right through the, through the round earth onto footings below. So it's, it's an engineered solution. I personally believe that that wall would have held up that roof. But the engineers, being the first time they'd worked with this material, they were, they were cautious, so they pushed it down to footings. But it does mean, obviously, that the earth doesn't have to be the work, doesn't have to be the work of, of holding down the roof. And that's, that's probably one of its biggest weaknesses, is the tensile strength. Again, here, we've got quite big openings with steel lintels over. And... And what's amazing about this building is, is the brilliant acoustics that the earth gives. This is a music venue. Those windows that you see there in front, they open up completely. It can be an indoor outdoor venue. Okay, so that, uh, I mean, I've really just tried to give a little bit of what you must watch for in the earth. Um, 20 minutes is a very short little time to talk. But just to, just to see what you can do and, and try and inspire people. So the, there's a lot um, we're still finding out about the earth. It is a sculpture material, and I think that in Berkey Library is, is quite interesting. I'm actually pretty sure, confident that if they gave me the construction project, I can do it as those drawings have shown, um, because we have done we have done similar stuff. We actually have. I've got an amazing team that I work with. We, we our oldest engineer is 95 years old. He built a road with houses in, in, in the So he's got a lot of experience. And uh, um, it, it is a drawback of earth construction is the reliance on experience because every soil is different and it needs a different stabilization, but it also handles differently when you're ramming it. So the, the sandy soils are very easy to stamp. They can pack down very nicely. They're very easy, but they're very difficult to patch when a mistake gets made and something gets knocked off. They have very little cohesion. Um, clay soils are easier to to uh, repair and everything, but much harder. If you put a little bit too much water in your mix, you're trying to stamp a rubber, a piece of rubber, you stamp that side of your form, it bounces up the other side. So all of those little things does come down to a bit of experience, but I, but I do think and uh, we, we are building up a body of people. Um, I've been training up builders. We, we actually take a new team. We've got a new place so that we create experienced builders. In and uh, we are building up a lot of um, experience in, uh, in earth building throughout South Africa. And, and local people do have experience in their own technologies. And, and these technologies are not that much different to what additional construction was. Okay. Great. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to stop you there because I know that you have a lot to share, but we also still have another presentation. Yeah. Um, but thank you very much. It, and, and there is quite a number of questions on the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat box on your side and maybe you can start answering some of these uh, questions already. I, I enjoyed it. It was great to see so many different projects and and all the different projects that you've done and like all the different um colors and and textures that that, that rammed earth can can bring it looks really really beautiful thank you so i'm going to hand over to matthew all right 
All right, so I'm, I'm going to try and move quite fast because I think there are a lot, probably a lot of questions. I, I just want to frame this as really a case study. I don't by any means have Paul's experience. And I, I, when I started this project, I was a very young architect. My client is Angus Fleming. He might actually be present in the lecture. Uh, he's, uh, he works with MMT, Mass Timber, MTT, Mass Timber Technologies now, so you know him. And really, I was, I was, it was a bit of an accident. Angus's architect had to go do something else, so he referred me, and we got together, and we went through a whole process. I'm just going to run through the pictures. You can get a sense. It's not a pure rammed house, a rammed earth house. It's got a lot of different technologies in it. But very fortunately, one of the best clients I've ever had, very adventurous, and I was having a lot of fun, and maybe we went a little far on some things, but it's a fantastically performing house, and uh, it's still used to this day. Okay, so there's Angus with his wife. Angus is like six foot four, I think, and Auntie is about four foot three, with many kids. And the house was a timeshare house. They had four families sharing the house. You can see 12 children, 16 bicycles, and parties for up to 100 people. So it was an interesting challenge. And where it is, it's in Miamal, which is one of the coldest parts of the country. Um, and it's in a tiny little town. The bikers go through there. There's Siakoi Flay with hippos and birds and things, but it's really quite removed. And that's the kind of scenery you see. So I, I try to take some inspiration from there. When we, we looked at it, we saw that it could get down as, as, close, as low as minus 10 degrees down there, plus snow. So, you know, at the time I was a little worried. I thought, I don't know if the rammed earth is going to do it, but yeah, that was it. So we started with geotech. It's an area of Oaklip, which is um, a very, very dense uh, material, easy to build on. But it did have a perched water table, so we had some tricky foundation conditions. And I just started brainstorming with Angus. We just sat down. I came up with all these different ideas of trying to understand skin-to-volume ratios of how, how effective a long, thin building would be or a very compact building. And by the end of it, I realized, based on the climate, that we could get away with just about anything. Once you factor in the rammed earth, you, you can pretty. it's an incredibly forgiving material. But these are all just the studies that I did to try and understand how to get it all to work. So there's the first 3D model that we did. I did it in SketchUp back before Revit was a big thing. And really, we it, it sort of works on two courtyards with a bedroom for each couple and then a kid's large shared dormitory with a playroom. And you can see the plan there. So if you look, so this these rooms here are the bedrooms centered around the, the northern courtyard. There's the kids' bedrooms, girls and boys, and the playroom with their toilets and then the living areas over here. So I'm gonna take a moment to explain how I deployed the rammed earth. What we did was we used a combination of 400 mil thick walls, okay, to the north and east, okay, and some internal, and then we used a permanent concrete form polystyrene block to the south and west. Part of it was because the wind comes from the west, so we didn't want the wind cooling down the rammed earth. It's quite sensitive to ambient air, as I'm sure Paul can tell you. Um, and we didn't, we were worried about the time factor. We had a limit. It was a very much a shoestring budget, and we didn't want to do it all in rammed earth. And we felt it would be a nice contrast as well. In retrospect, maybe that permanent concrete form, we could have used something better. It works well, but it was difficult to finish. And you can see the scale of the houses. It's quite large. But we worked very hard on getting all the flows to work and how it all work together. At the bottom, you can see garage with the plant room. Plant room was going to take all the advanced kit we were going to try and get this thing to zero energy house and zero water and all that. And we kind of did, you know, back, this was back in 2008, nine, I think, um, seven, eight, nine. So before net zero was really big, we kind of accidentally headed there. Um, I, I really enjoy the plan, really works well. Client is very happy as far as I know. And there's the roof plan. It was a tricky roof plan, but I used a lot of tricks in terms of planning from Japanese tea house style in terms of gradients of privacy. So I, I went a little further and, and looked at Japanese roofing, and to my surprise, instead of some grand system, they just hoy, they just put roofs wherever. So I did the same thing, and it worked out quite well. And uh, the only flat roof, really, we had is over the garage because the solar panels were going to go there. And there's a flat roof uh, susp well, suspended slab over the library here, under the, uh, over the kitchen area. That, that lounge is a double volume. It's the only big true double volume there's a one and a half volume in the kids play area which has got a climbing wall in it i think or that was the plan don't know if it ever got built so that, that those are the plans fairly straightforward um four bedrooms courtyard kids pool courtyard and the, the pool courtyard um goes pool 
it's covered open patio, lounge, and then straight out. And you can open all those doors and look straight through. I'll show you the views now. The kitchen has a, uh, a wraparound sort of prep area, and each of these areas can, as I recall, no, maybe just one or two has a roller shutter because it's a holiday house. So you just close off those appliance areas of the roller shutter. But the kitchen can join into the dining room and become one super dining room for large areas. Plus that patio um, is, is really expansive for using this for parties. All right, so that's that. And let's just go through some of the images. Um, so I totally agree with Paul. I mean, rammed earth is a labor of love. And, you know, we, we got the best guys we could, but mistakes were made. You can see some of the shuttering, the, the joint lines weren't carried through. It hasn't failed, and it certainly adds a bit of character, but it, it does give an incredible finish and feel to the thing. I, I love rammed earth. It just does require a lot of love to get it to work. I was a young architect, and I read a book um, by, I think it's David Easton, and you know, it's a rammed earth Bible. Now, we weren't brave enough, so we just went with concrete beams, but what we did do, was we split the beams in the middle to thermally break them, and there's a piece of insulation between the inner and outer beams so that the heat flow problems aren't a problem. As it turns out, we were worrying needlessly. The house performed so well, we probably didn't need to do that, um, even in the climate that it's in. Admittedly, Memel doesn't get quite as hot as Botswana. It does get a lot colder, um, but it still performs flawlessly. On a hot day, 32 degrees, the interior temperature is about 20, 21, with no air conditioning. On a winter, in the winter, we've designed the house well enough that um, you just throw some logs in the fire. All the other rooms are facing north and they collect sun. We've got thermi thermally insulated slabs. I think we use 25 mils of polystyrene and a 60 or 70 mil screed, and they just soak up all the heat, and that's all the heating you need. So it works exceptionally well. Um, yeah, that was just my website that I had in terms of dealing with integrating technologies. That was a long time ago. There's the house, there's the book, David Easton, Rammed Earth House. Very, very good book. Um, a lot of the tech comes from Australia and America. Um, and, you know, we played it safe. We didn't go crazy. Um, but that's got everything you need to know. I'm sure Paul's got more books that he can recommend as well. So if anyone's interested, that's the book. Right, so we looked at straw bale originally. And... Um, we just weren't convinced that there were too many things that could go wrong. We, we wanted a very environmentally sensitive house. We looked at a couple of tech technologies and we just felt straw bale was too risky because of moisture control and you need special lime plasters and everything. So we went for rammed earth and we, we after all the processes, we, we began construction. You can see the ICFs there, polystyrene Lego blocks that you fill with concrete. Very cool technology, but getting the plaster to work was tricky. And getting the, the butt joints to work took a bit of thinking, but we got it to work. Um, but it worked exceptionally well. It, it, thermally, it behaves quite similarly to the rammed earth, but just in a different way. Um, the, the rammed earth does, sort of absorbs and releases heat differently. The, the ICFs insulate more than anything else. Um, we tried some different colored systems. We, we, as Paul noted, we spent quite a few months getting all the sampling right and doing test walls. These were some retaining walls that we used as tests at the back of the site. And we did use a fair bit of concrete. Um, and we did it all precast and got it shipped down and just dropped it in. And I think I should say a note here that although I, I get what Paul's saying is we should try and reduce our carbon front, footprint on any building as much as possible. And as a commercial architect, I'm guilty of many sins. Um, but there, there are limits. Concrete can do things that rammed earth can't do. And sometimes you just have to use it. I think. If, if, if I say conservatively, we reduced the concrete in the house by 70%, I'd say that's pretty good. And certainly more could be done. I, for example, didn't know that you, if you used lime, you could get away with no lintels over the small windows. If I'd known that, you know, we probably would have done some, some things differently. Um, so what you see is there's the uh, chimney. That's a specially designed chimney. Again, over-designed, but I was very excited that has got an internal and an external flue to maximize heat recovery. I was reading about Russian fireplaces in the Siberian steppes where they, they build these massive fireplaces with complex baffles and things that capture every last little erg of heat energy. So we did something similar here. We've got a concrete shell with vents that, that release at low and high air levels. One of them releases into the library um, and then an internal metal flue. So you maximize the radiation of the flue and the concrete soaks up the rest and distributes the heat. Works very well. Um, and then that, that was just a portal 
that I want. Uh, Paul mentioned the services issue, so we I used the concrete elements to do a lot of the service reticulation. So I mean, this is nothing new. You see that there's the chimney. There's some samples of the different. Um, interestingly, how the earth looks when it's freshly out of the shutter is quite rich, but over time it fades. So you've got to take that into account. Um, but we got quite neat junctions on most of the earth to concrete joints, and it looked pretty good. Something you do have to accept with rammed earth is simply that it's got a, a slightly more rustic feel. It's just not going to be a, I mean, I've seen houses in Australia where they're using machinery to do all the ramming and, and very expensive shuttering. You can get very, very nice finishes, but we were on a shoestring. We, we did our best and we got a reasonable finish, but sometimes, you know, you see some slight variations and failures. It's not train smash territory, but it, you have to account for it. Um, we used some other tech here. This was a polystyrene void forming slab technology for the for the for the uh, garage flat roof. Worked pretty well. It's expensive, and you can probably do other things now. Um, but yeah, it was it worked for what we needed. Um, rain, yeah. So we had some hailstorms, and we had some damage to the facade, and it was also tricky casting at high level. So we we definitely got some some failures that we had to account for. And, and I would agree with Paul that building in rainy areas is something to be very thoughtful about. One of the things we chose to do was use a light steel frame roof just for load, because we weren't sure about the load. And um, I mean, subsequently we might have reconsidered, but it also worked out very good in terms of span capability. And all we did was plugged in little timber pieces at the end for the eaves where the raft is projected. And it worked very well. Um, <clears throat> just some pictures of how that worked and how we how we dealt with it. Um, there's the interior of a, a ramming a shattering system. Okay, so, so that's typically what you'll see. And you'll, you'll see a, a variety of roughness and damage. You know, we didn't have the most skilled labor and the guys weren't taking that much care, um, but we did our best. And you can see how we plugged the, uh, the rafters into the light steel. For, um, I'm not sure if this is light steel or just very light gauge preformed lip channels. I can't remember. Um, you can see some of the roughness of the way the concrete meets the rammed earth. If you're not careful when they when they take the shutters off, you do get these rough lines, but we accepted it. Um, and then we did a lot of the services. That was the other, other reason, sorry, I did forget. The permanent con concrete um, polystyrene blocks let you put in services very easily. So you just chase into the polystyrene, drop your services in and plaster over, and you don't have to worry about using the rammed earth to accommodate your services. But again, there's a myriad ABTs out there that you could do the same thing with. Um, you can see the hail damage on this picture on this end wall. It really shredded the thing. But since then, once we coated it, like Paul mentioned, we, we used a silicon-based exterior coating. Even though the damage had happened, it, no further damage has occurred. Once you've stabilized that rammed earth, it's fine. You can see there a column that I designed. It was a really cheap steel column with a universal head. It could take a beam from any direction, and it was quite cheap to make, and it worked very well. Um, and then we did looked at some floor coloring. We were using uh, some sort of uh, color hardener for the cement floors. Um, I was keen to do earth floors, but I think Angus wasn't that keen, so we just did some samples. We used sandstone for our, our lintels. It was available in the area, and we used aluminum windows, um, and hence the concrete beams. We weren't sure. Uh, how it would perform. Subsequently, I guess if you got the right timber, you could. I would be confident to use a timber beam. But the sandstone worked very well, and we used sandstone cladding over a brick foundation. So you, you know, all you see is the sandstone and the and the rammed earth, and it turned out to be reasonably cost effective. There you can see the uh, the uh, sandstone cladding on the brick foundation. Um, interestingly, because of the perched water table, we had to put holes in the foundation to let the water through. Otherwise, it would dam up internally. So some things, you know, um, I've, I've seen studies of stacked slate foundations that would have worked as well. But Angus is a builder, client's a builder, commercial builder. So he, he knew what he knew, and we, and we just did it the way we knew, and it worked out very well. And then obviously the waterproofing, we put uh, a cementitious waterproofing um, just underneath the rammed earth. And maybe Paul can advise on better ways to do that, but... It, it's quite high off the ground as it is, so perhaps it wasn't even necessary. And I'm sure if Paul says uh, using lime makes it naturally waterproof, maybe it, it's not necessary if you use lime. But we were using cement. 
Um, speaking of which, I think we used about a five or six percent cement mix into the rammed earth, and we didn't notice a huge performance loss. But this isn't as hot as Botswana, so maybe um, if, we, if, we, if you use cement up in the more extreme climates, you would notice it. We, the client has never mentioned anything about the performance. It's a, it's a really well-performing house. Anyway, so that's how, well, how I was taught it last year, is give it good shoes and a good hat, and, and everything will be fine. So there's our shoes, sandstone, cladded over brickwork. And then we jumped into solar water. Um, we had a, a, a lot of solar water panels, and um, it, it works very well. Back then, it was relatively new. We had a dedicated room for that. But I guess I wouldn't say anything that's not remarkable these days. Um, we did do a black water system. Took a bit of getting right, but we got that to work as well. And um, that was one of the first black water systems because um, most of the houses down there have septic tanks. So we just chose to do this, and it worked out fine. So we got a lot of services off grid effectively. Um, I think there is a grid connection, and I can't, I couldn't tell you if Angus has added solar PV yet. But we used, you know, the, the power draw on the house is so low it, it hardly matters. Anyway, the detailing, yes, you get variations in in the round earth. You can see some speckled stuff there, and the concrete that wasn't the best pour, but it was okay. So it's a slightly more rustic finish, but I li I like it, and a lot of people do. A lot of it's got a soft feel. That's not as maybe um, sharp or aggressive as very modern detailing in, in some houses. And uh, some people, like you, I guess you either like it or you don't. Um, we liked it, so we were very happy with it. Um, and then we, we just picked out some very interesting detailing just to add some character to the house. We did this um, laser cut metal screen of these blue blue herons, which is endemic to the area, which are endemic to the area. You get a lot of those blue herons that you can see at the flay. And there's the, the column detail that I designed just to make it a bit more interesting. It was a very turned out to be quite a cost-effective way. Um, we did uh, we used sustainably sourced timber decking. I think I've got some other pictures. Yeah, and for the uh, so there's the base of the column that was for the staircase. That's all sustainably sourced teak from Botswana or Zimbabwe. I can't remember. Um, all laser cuts. I was in love with laser cut stealing back steel back then. And, went a bit crazy but yes it worked um right so so there's the finished house <clears throat> and you can see the, the polystyrene icf units with their plaster next to the round earth concrete beams and we did choose to plaster the top because we had some rough finishes at the top there um and you can see through the uh, glass doors that's the lounge and into the pool at the back and then over here is the kitchen um, which was quite successful. There, there were some things we weren't happy with. Some of the, some of the construction quality wasn't ideal, but you know, on on a very tight shoestring, we did a pretty good job. I also was quite obsessive back then. I, I didn't realize just how over-designed this thing was. I wanted to insulate the concrete chimney to to prevent heat loss. It was just that's in the noise at that point. It was really overkill. Um, right, some of the interiors. There's the kitchen. Um, and you can see the roller shutter over the appliance counter. There's that portal. Uh, this isn't finished. The lights were supposed to go in there. That's a, it's just a nice thing. We we obviously used concrete beams. We 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 didn't know. I don't think we could afford timber beams of that size, and we knew how to do the concrete. We also used some very interesting. We used thermoacoustics insulation, which is a semi-rigid, recycled board, very very high performing ceiling. It's a combination ceiling and insulation system and it worked very well just very straightforward cornices but you can see these cornices are a bit skew here and there because the, to get it straight was tricky so again there's some compromises there um, there you can see the scale of the chimney the the wood burning stove goes in there and it's got vents out the back and up into the library at the top but you can see the lovely quality of it. I mean it just develops this rammed earth develops an incredible patina next to the concrete and it really worked very well um, some of the detailing was a problem, and we did our best, um, but, but there it is. The doors were also made out of um, sustainably sourced teak. All, all the doors, windows, and all that stuff was sustainably sourced teak. It has, you know, it looks it looks like some of the rammed earth has broken down, but it hasn't failed beyond that. So you will get these slight variations, and if you get really good shattering, and maybe the lime would hold have held it together better. So that would be a fun experiment. That's the kitchen. 
very simple stuff. Um, I think the tricky parts, yeah, getting a beam that can span long distances in round earth. And so we chose to use the, the concrete ICFs there. Um, there's our multicolored wall. We did one of the one of the bedrooms there. And yeah, some of it's really nice, some of it's a bit speckly. Worked out okay. And the the floors worked out very nicely with um color hardener. Um there's there's a I think we did yes, that's right. What you see on the right is a polished concrete for the kitchen countertop, which worked out sort of as a sort of a modern analogue of the rammed earth texture. Just nice contrasts. Um, just some exterior images. Um, there's one of the bedrooms. It's a, just a lovely bedroom. You know, you just ride on, onto nature. Worked out very well. Some of the bathrooms. I was a very young architect, so I make no apologies. Mistakes were made, but fun was had. So it all worked out in the end. Some of the detailing we thought about didn't work out quite as well as we hoped. We used teak to clad the reveals of all the windows and things. That's the TV appliance area where another roller shutter, you can lock it off during the holidays. But I didn't quite get that detailing right, but it still looks okay. Um, there's another bedroom. And as I said, because these floors are basically got 25 mils of polystyrene under them or 80 mil concrete slab, and they're all facing north, there's an, almost no heating required for this house. It's such a simple solution. We didn't expect it to work that well. And that plus the rammed earth, they, they use no heating or cooling almost year round. I think when it gets really cold, they throw some wood logs in the fireplace because because the lounge is the only east facing room and it's fine. And there's your bathroom, a lovely space to to get comfy in the bath. That's the outside. I, I, a friend of mine had a wedding under there. We had like 100 people and the house easily accommodated it. It's very fine. You can see a door out onto the top of the um, garage. There was going to be a sundowner deck, but I'm not sure if they ever used it. I think we just put the solar panels up there, and that was that. That's the that's the porch. Just worked out. Even this is really interesting. I mean, the, the thermal control of Rammed Earth is exceptional. I've, I've never encountered anything like it. Plus the humidity control. So in winter it humidifies the air, and in summer it dehumidifies the air, and it also does all these amazing temperature control um, absorption and release um, effects. On a hot day, standing out on the grass, it's about 30, you can feel it's about 32. Crossing under the porch, okay, with an insulated roof, it dropped to about 26. And as soon as you go inside, it dropped to about 21. With all the doors open the whole day, the interior temperatures have stayed 21. It's absolutely incredible. So in terms of thermal control, rammed earth is exceptional. There's another view of the pool courtyard. It wasn't finished there. You can see some rain damage on that, that wall getting. Rammed earth high up is a challenge. It's expensive because of shuttering and all that. So one has to think about that. Um, a few more images of the outside. The cosmos, just for funsies. And there's the, the pool courtyard. Um, that's a naturally a natural pool as well. There's no chlorine or salt or anything. It's a naturally um, pure, uh, what do you call it? A natural pool. It use, it's got a little pond with fish and and plants and things that clean clean the water automatically. And there's the multicolored walls on the kids' playroom area. Just some other images. You can see some of the rammed earth came out quite smooth, some rough. Sometimes it's because they over ram it and the water seeps out and you get a smoother finish. Sometimes just you get a more granular mix of soil. We had some outdoor little nooks for seating. It was fun to do. There's a very young me. Okay. Nothing special there. There's the lounge. You can see it opening out into the pool. Just a very, very functional house. It's the kitchen area. Stairs weren't complete yet there. That's the library upstairs. You can see the heating vent for the <clears throat> dissipation of excess heat from the, the stove up there. Um, there's the bedroom for the outside. That's the children's playroom. Uh, that's into one of the bedrooms. That was some detailing on the garage that was a balustrade that I designed with laser cut details. I think I made some people curse very loudly to get that built. Just some more textural images. Uh, laser cut and that's it. Sorry, I rushed through it a bit, but I think Paul covered most of the technical stuff. I didn't want to take too much time. So I would say in summary, it was a very, very fun project. I had a great client. We learned a huge amount. 
and we, I think we pulled off a pretty good house on a very tight budget. And I never got to do another one. I think Paul's lucky like that to to get to play with this stuff all the time. But it is it can be stressful. You need a very high skill level and a lot of experience, like the man said. I think I, I, could, I've, I could certainly do it better this time around. Thanks for watching. Great. Thanks, Matthew. That was amazing. And long overdue as well. We were talking about this presentation for a long time. I think there's a number of questions in the chat box and I'm going to go backwards. Your client, Angus, has confirmed it's still performing really well. So <laughs> well done on that. Uh, one question from Michelle. Could you possibly point to good references or examples of ramped earth construction processes in buildings that are constituted, not freestanding, They're unfolding over time as found in Yemen and Morocco? I, th I think in China, and I forget what they call, but they do build those Chinese round houses which are built over many years and they actually con constitute an entire village. Um, those are examples I can think of off my head. Uh, oh, the Chaka. Is it a Chaka house? Yeah, it's, it's an entire village, you know, so it's, and they're actually about 2,000 yeah. years old. Still with people living in them today and they still look uh, pretty amazing, the photographs I've seen of them. Haka homes. Haka, sorry. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. <laughs> if anyone has a burning question and want to put up their hand, please, please put up your hand and I can unmute you. I saw another question from Marty. One of the perceived problems with ramped earth buildings is the difficulty of being able to patch the walls and still achieve an aesthetically acceptable final product. It doesn't really offer flexibility for late changes or change of use. I'd agree with that. Paul, you want to comment on that? Well, uh, patching is, is definitely not easy, but it is possible. You know, in all our projects we've worked on, and I think we've got a very high level of finish with the feet. And we've had to we've had to patch. I mean, on a construction site, people knock off corners, and they do damage the walls by mistake. It definitely is a, a disadvantage, you know, you don't want to do it willy-nilly. But if you really do have to do it, it is possible. And uh, we, I always advise all my clients, because, you know, I'm in the fortunate position. I'm actually an architect. I design Randworth houses, but I also run a construction team and we build them. So mm. I've had the experience of all sides on this. And what we also do to overcome that to some extent is we put in additional um, service points which is quite easily and cheap to do right at the beginning. And the other one, obviously, is using a plinth wall or your ceilings to actually uh, make some allowance for changes. But, yeah, look, when we've had a gas pipe that has to be put there, the stove has to go there, you know, we do chase in afterwards. We can patch it. One of the things about patching is it often takes uh, three or four months for it to actually go back to invisible. So it takes a long time, and I think there was a picture where there was new ram birth next to old ram birth. And you do have that phenomenon. We are, we are very careful, obviously, to record our mixes. But we can go back to any part of the wall and we know exactly which mix to mm. put there. Because it's quite hard to do it by eye. And that's where you can get into difficulty. So you've got to have kind of quite a, a thorough way of actually remembering every line, what mixture it is, how do you got to that color. Paul? Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you use very high quality shuttering and mechanical mixing, you can get much better results. Uh, definitely. And I mean, I think you, I think you saw there on that, uh, that project we did like in Elephant Point. Uh, that is actually hand mixed, but it is pneumatically stamped. So we didn't talk much about difference in stamping. You know, the hand, uh, auto cottage I did, that's purely by hand, but I've also done buildings purely by machine. And with the machine, it's more consistent. You get less honeycombing. Um, and you know, I use now a Perry formwork of shuttering, um, and that's that's the thing that, that that pops together with only a millimeter gap between shutters um, at most. And you you know you you can just as you pull the shutters off, you knock down the line, and your your shutter joints are virtually invisible. But definitely, um, high end shuttering does make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, okay, maybe just ask a, a bit further and thanks for answering my question if you don't if, if that's okay 
Um, so, so, for example, if you say you had to chase in the wall into this wall that we're seeing on the screen, it's obviously got various layers. Now, those were all rammed from the top. You can't recreate that ramming from the top feeling. I mean, surely you will never be able to make that um, patch uh, disappear. Uh, even if you do kind of try and uh, do the sort of sand in the in the bottle kind of effect to get the layers and whatever, because you're ramming it from the side as opposed to from the top, surely that's almost impossible to achieve. It's, I wouldn't say it's impossible. We we have achieved it. Eh? So, but it, it it it's not a it's not an easy thing. It's not nearly, you know, it takes a lot of time. You've got to then mix up whatever those. I generally work with three different mixes actually, and we just vary them a little bit. So I try not to go with too many colours. But, you know, we will we will stamp from the bottom. We will stamp from the front. We'll stamp that colour, then we'll put the next colour in the next colour, and it is a laborious, slow process. But once it's done, that, that and you leave it for, as I say, three or four months, you will not even pick up where we have fixed it before. So it can be done, but it's it's not desirable because it costs you a lot more money to fix that one little chase than uh, you know, when you when you're stamping it, you you can be stamping um, four, six guys will generally stamp about six cubes a day, but when you're patching like something like that, it'll, it'll be two guys taking. Uh, two weeks actually working at it. The right way to do it, if I inject, is to plan your services very carefully up front and don't change them and get everything in and use all the tricks in the book. Like if you've got walls that aren't rammed earth, run as many services in there um, and just avoid, you know, going into the rammed earth if you can. Um, that's That's the way to do it. Um, there's a great question in the chat box. Um, could you achieve smaller housing units re using rammed earth, preferably on a commercial scale? Okay. Well, as a commercial architect, and I've done a lot of housing, um, I think you'd have to run the numbers very carefully, and I think the labor-intensive quality would have to give way to mechanical processes for a start. So unless it's in a very remote area, you know, there's a hundred variables. If the land costs cheap, sure, you can do a lot of things. But if the land costs marginal and the area is marginal and you've got very small rooms, you start getting a very high ratio of wall to area. So you're losing GLA or, or usable area to wall, which where on a normal commercial project, you'd be using very thin walls. For example, I use aerated concrete blocks now as a, as a standard, which are 150 thick um, to get a, you know, to encapsulate a 40 square meter unit. If you jump that up to 400 or 500, you'd end up losing a few square meters. So the, the commercial thing would have to be looked at carefully. I, I'm absolutely certain it can be done. We just have to make sure the right project, you know, it's, you've got the right project for that vehicle. Um, and maybe not student housing, maybe low cost housing. Obviously, it would work fairly well on one or two stories. Once you go up more, you have more challenges. Plus, it's it's not light. It's not very strong. I think it's a couple of MPA. A 400, 400 wide wall is a three. I think three MPA. So it's not like a brick, which is seven seven and a half to fifteen MPA. So you've probably got limits in terms of load and how you designed for it. So you, you might end up needing a concrete frame. And I know that the other lady mentioned that they've done multi-story mud buildings in Yemen and the, the Great Wall of China's around it. So you know anything can be done. It's just a commercial thing. But the one thing it does have going for it is that it controls temperature and humidity extremely well. And so your running costs would be theoretically very low. The, the, I think the real problem with commercial projects is the sites tend to dictate that you can't orient every room the way you want it. So you can't always use the sun the way you want. You can't control against wind. So it, it, it's challenging. I would say probably low-cost freestanding housing, absolutely. Multi-story, I would probably say no. I'm going to give Paul also an uh, opportunity to respond very quickly, and then we're going to wrap up because I'm aware of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, look, I mean, I've, I, I've done quite a bit of work on this, and uh, certainly feasible, and, and what you can do is when you when you scale it up, the land earth gets amazingly cheap, so you can virtually build houses for, for nothing. And if you're actually using repeated units, it's even cheaper. And incidentally enough, I looked at... Uh, project in Saudi Arabia, which was high-end, but they wanted to build a 1,000 villas a year, 
Yeah, one of the few ways they could achieve that. Is and the other one is I'm working, I'm actually working on a European research team, part of a team um, with a whole lot of uh, architecture and engineering schools in Europe. And they're, they're developing, um, they, they basically want to develop Earth as a, as a standard building practice in Europe. Um, we are looking at some five story land Earth buildings. Um, and, uh, hoping to actually build one in Botswana. So we'll see, hopefully, if, if the funding comes through, we'll do that as a prototype. Um, we're also it's obviously developing machines that can, can stamp out the land Earth much faster. And when we built that Helderberg Visitor Center, um, we built that in a month. Um, we were doing about 30 cubic meters of earth a day. Um, and we got a very good finish on that. It's not like we just do it and hope for the best. It's to a higher level of standard, but with machines in that you can go very quickly. And it actually does, I mean, look, I don't think we have a choice. We are going to be building land earth houses in the next 10 years on a commercial scale. If we are not doing that, we are basically heading for suicide. Um, and that's very clear from the the science we are seeing. We've, we've used up our carbon budget. So we actually have to go and uh, we have to be building with, with low carbon, with zero carbon materials. And Earth is, is one of the few that actually offers that. And in Southern Africa, we don't have sufficient timber to use timber as an alternative. So we basically are stuck with Earth. And the quicker we learn to use it and to actually take it and, and use the potential that the material offers, the better off we will be. Well, I'm going to squeeze in a quick question. Do, do, are there any courses for architects if they want to learn how to build with Brent Earth? Yes, I do run uh, courses. I run them on an ad hoc basis. Okay. And um, I just did one in November last year. And we are, we, are, we are continually doing them when we get a good site. And what I've also done is I also train contractors up. I've got a colleague in Cape Town that I took um, he knew nothing about Rand Earth, and I took him under, under my wing. He's now uh, has built houses, and he's, he's a fantastic uh, contractor. So we, we also do that. So, yeah, get hold of me, and uh, we can take it from there. Okay, great. Um, we did share your website in the beginning of this webinar, so if people want to find you, it is on simplysustainable.co.za. And then I'm going to quickly squeeze in another quick question and, um, and then we're really going to wrap up. Um, Andy was asking, what about getting past the NHBRC for new homes? It's not a problem. Not a we, problem. You know, no, I mean, you know, as long as an engineer is willing to sign off for it, we actually submitted our, our building and annotated the, the rammed earth as low strength concrete walls. And, um, you know, okay, admittedly, we submitted in, uh, I think it was Newcastle or Freda, and they approved the drawings in a day. But, uh, you know, as long as the engineer signs off, I'm sure Paul can confirm. In terms of XA, um, to me, you know, if I guess it depends on your school of thought. You know, if you, if you feel like you prefer smaller windows and all that stuff, you can do the, the standard 10400 XA compliance route. But otherwise, you spend 10 or 15,000 Rand and you get, an, a, like, you get Malus to do a compliance route, was it a type B or type C compliance route, and you sort it, then you can have all the windows you want. We use double glazing, you probably didn't even need to, but you can easily get it to comply. But and, uh, and he was specifically, specifically asking about the NHBRC, is there not, Andy, maybe you want to clarify your question, I can unmute you. Um... Oh, you're talking about the, the, the housing insurance guys that take our money and do nothing with it i don't know yes i actually don't know i've never gone through them for that particular project that, that house that i did that that lot that did in uh, elephant point that's nhbrc approved the nhbrc actually was so fascinated they came with 12 inspectors every inspection so they used it as actually a way to uh take their team um we've done an nhbrc approved in cape town Okay, so, so it's. I, I, look, I actually spend a long time. I'm not. So, I'm not a big fan of the NSPC. I spend a lot of time. I said it couldn't be approved, but now we've just gone on and we've we've applied in different in, in restrictions, and they've approved it. And um, basically, they have no real legal um, rationale not to approve it, because it is approved under the national 
building regulations um, is an allowance for rational design. And uh, if you do it to rational design, there's actually nothing that they, you know, legally they can say this is not permitted. So initially they were pushing their weight around because they wanted people to get, to pay them extra monies and all sorts of things. But mm. I think they realized they've lost that battle and uh, I think there's been some change in staff. I, I, I've had, uh, on the Monaghan farm, we eventually got an ex exemption from NHBRC. Uh, the client had to, to fund that entirely himself. Um, but uh, subsequently that, we've actually found they've got a more open attitude and they seem to be approving uh, their firms without a problem. Last question. I, I just want to ask you, um, when I was doing research on the building, I know that Australia and America has um, very clear and documented code for round earth, but I don't know if we do yet. Um, can you advise? No, there is not. A, there is there is a provision for a code on earth buildings, but it hasn't been written yet. Um, and we hopefully will get something that is work being done on it. I unfortunately, I was in Botswana for the last three or four years, so the process stopped, but I will find out where it's at again. We are, there is provision made in the, in the building regulations for an earth building code to actually come in. So there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's an, a code allocated for earth building. At the moment, we use a rational design process. I mean, I've developed that. You basically have to show that your land earth complies with all of the, you know, it's not just structure, which people get stuck on. It's also obviously the soundproofing, the fireproofing, weathering, all of that rainproofing. You've got to just show that it complies with the, the regulations and you, and you can get a rational design through without too much problem. I've done that pretty much in all, all the big municipalities. The smaller ones we haven't had any issue with. All right, I'm going to stop you guys there and I'm going to wrap up the the webinar there's still communications going on the chat so keep them going i think that's that's always good and paul and matthew if you allow me to share your presentations or your details with the registered people then um, we can do that tomorrow so just to run through quickly what's next this year next month we're doing uh, regenerative residential design so we're talking about how you can use software modeling to understand how your building is going to perform in the future we've got um, two quite experienced guys talking about that in march we're going to talk about regenerative community and in april we'll talk happy and healthy building so those are the upcoming uh, webinars um again if you know anybody who wants to sponsor these webinars uh, please let us now reach out to us thank you to our speakers paul and matthew really appreciated your input i knew we were going to run over time because there's so much to talk about about this topic so maybe we'll do a part two in the second half of this year and um, and get the conversation going again on on building with earth because i think there's a lot to still talk about Again, just a reminder, previous webinars, you can find them on greennet.co.za. And I know that we are a couple of months behind with the uploading of the recordings, but I know Michelle is in the audience, just a nudge that we need to get up to scratch again. And that's, that's it for today. And I thank you very, very much. We had a record number of attendees today, so that is really encouraging and really great. And to see that not we're not yet tired of these webinars. So thank you for attending and hope to see you next month. Have a good evening and thanks, Paul. Thanks, Matthew, for your contributions today. That's really awesome. Thanks, thanks. guys. Thanks. Thanks.